There's a lot of injustice in the world, there's a lot of brokenness in the world, and all of that's converging in the case of George Zimmerman and Trayvon Martin. Zimmerman, of course, was found not guilty by the court. And, uh, of course, there's a lot of reaction to this, all of it violent, uh, emotionally at least, um, and of course some, somewhat literally. And this is a case where it calls for both a level-headedness and a degree of emotional investment, too. Um, the people who were very, very angry and called this an injustice, of course, uh, legally speaking, I mean, a lot of people predicted, a lot of legal experts, that Zimmerman would be found not guilty because he, because the law allows for him. Even though he uh, gave up the, sta uh, the stand-your-ground defense, uh, still, the prosecution couldn't prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he was not in danger, that he wasn't acting in self-defense. Um, and that's exactly, like, that's the point. The, the court deliberately has a very high standard because it wants to err on the side of not condemning innocent people. So when people snarl, this is, is, is an injustice, well, again, the, the issue is not the court said that Zimmerman acted rightly or sensibly. The point is he didn't sh murder a guy. He, it couldn't be, it, or at least it couldn't be proven beyond a shadow of doubt, beyond a reasonable doubt, that he wasn't under attack, basically, and, and even the prosecution admitted that probably Mar uh, Trayvon Martin was on top of him, probably, like, I mean, when the police said he didn't have to follow him, that was kind of ambiguous, or we didn't, we don't need you to do that, that was ambiguous, so legally, and this is where we have to be level-headed, it's not like this court was racist or whatever, that's the law, now is the law broken, that's, that's worth discussing, but it is interesting to see people calling for murder, basically, but calling for vigilante justice, calling for, saying that the law isn't working, so we should take it into our own hands, and we should kill, there's, mobs should kill Zimmerman, and start a race war, basically, in the case of the Black Panthers. What, well, if, if you're going to oppose him for acting outside the law, taking the law into his own hands, that seems hypocritical. But, of course, that's the nature of the situation, because, and this is the other thing, emotions all have to be involved in this. You can't just look at this clinically. You can't just look at this in a detached way. A lot of people will, who are in favor of the Zimmerman, the pro-Zimmerman verdict, will say, almost in passing, well, it is a, it is unfortunate that Martin was killed. It's a tragedy that he was killed, and then they'll launch it. But, no, you can't do that, I don't think. That's not that's not true. Like, that's, there's a certain untruth to that. No, this is really, really sad and tragic and unfortunate, and Zimmerman should have, we, we can wish that Zimmerman had stayed in his car, or approached it completely differently, and we should. We should no, want him to have not killed Trayvon Martin. We should acknowledge that primarily and say it in a heated way and then say but in spite of that sadly you know the fact of the matter is uh that it did happen and now we have to deal with the ramifications of it um and and i don't see that there needs to be uh, but but it's interesting as well that uh the prosecution said that uh, having an all-female jury actually worked in zimmerman's favor because women are more empathetic and therefore they could relate to zimmerman's feelings of being terrorized uh, well, I mean, conversely, you could say, well, did they sympathize with Trayvon Martin feeling intimidated by uh, a creepy-ass cracker following him around? It appears he may have felt like a gay guy was, was following him with the intent to rape him. Um, it's, it, again, what you see is a lot of misunderstanding on both sides here, right? You see, you see both people assuming something about the other and acting violently as a result of it. Um, no, I, it seems to me Zimmerman was not a racist, per se. Was he engaging in racial profiling? Well, perhaps. I mean, the guy was a mixed-race Hispanic himself, if you want to use that language. You know, he, he had multiple ethnicities in his background. Um, he was a registered Democrat who voted for Obama, and he only got a gun because the police told him to, because I think there was a rabid dog in his neighborhood, and they told him he needed a gun to protect himself, um, who had mentored black kids in the past. I mean, there's no evidence that he was a racist per se, but the fact of the matter is that he had previously seen a black kid walking through the streets, looking into windows, reported it, and it turned out that guy was a thief. So, sadly, he had, you know, some precedent for wanting to, for, for being on the alert and profiling. I mean, is and so what we can t say from that is, was he a racist? Well, the sad realities are, there are economic realities in America, and... E 
poor economic status is associated with crime, and therefore, rather than dealing with, rather than getting angry about Zimmerman being an alleged racist, we should be more angry. We should see this as a reaction. Or we should react to this in such a way that we say we need to address the systematic institutional racism, which is keeping black people down, and that's and so such that so if somebody sees a black person wearing a hoodie, they can get nervous because they've had encounters in the past that have led them to be nervous now. That's what we should be getting angry about. That's the kind of racism that we should be angry at. And and by the way, everyone who's posted on Facebook all these cases of, like, black people killing white people and saying, well, where's the injustice there? Well, there is, I mean, people, or where's the anger there? Where's the anger at this? Where's the anger at black people killing white people? Well, the issue is, uh, like, that's not really the point. I mean, any, anyone's angry and sad when people get killed, or at least they should be, um, other than people who really are racist against white people. But the issue is here... Uh, I think the thing that people are responding to is that um, the law seems to exonerate somebody who, with a gun for killing an unarmed person. That's the people are angry about. That, that's what people are really responding to, rightly or wrongly. So it seems to me that um, we do need to have a lot of passion with this case, and people who are writing emotionally should be, because it, it's one that involves human life. Uh, and we, But we should also be looking at this rationally, and we should also be willing to affirm boldly the truth on both sides of both people and this is where i think it's this is where the christian response i think has to come in and this is where the christian response is the most controversial i think in some ways because let's look at the christian worldview in general um humans have caused dysfunction humans have caused sin in our rebellion of god and have broken the world order and broken our relationships to each other and why does God allow sin and God has got to allow suffering and injustice? Well, we can talk about God has, like, God allows it for some greater purpose, but that's not very satisfying, right? That makes God seem very Machiavellian and like a chess master. Actually, what the Christian, the biblical response is that we have rebelled against God and hurt ourselves by our sin and caused our own death. And so God has actually entered into our situation and curiously made it such that because we turned that injustice on him and killed him, caused him to suffer but through that very process of suffering through that sin that we caused christ was able to take that and through it create an offering to the father which actually reconciles us to himself so god enters our suffering god enters our injustice and actually in it itself through submitting to it through responding to it in love that actually creates the situation of injustice and reparation so that suffering itself, you know, death that was an enemy ends up strangely bringing us back to God, ends up bringing us back to justice, ends up bringing us back to Eden and to paradise. And moreover, because God assumed human nature, well, first of all, because God became material in the first place, all of matter is sanctified, but specifically because God became a human and we're already made in the image of God, this means that all humans are joined to Christ. And, and there's an Eastern tradition where that's why we'll all be resurrected. It's because we're all joined to Christ. Everyone, every human looks like Jesus and is an image of Jesus. And and that not only by virtue of being human, but by virtue of being in the human situation, which Christ entered very specifically into. He wasn't just a guy who had, took a human body. He lived on earth. He lived among people. He lived as a carpenter. He entered our situation and dealt with our strife and our trouble. And he experienced it himself. It was like us in all respects except for sin. And because he specifically took on injustice... That means that we can see in injustice, we can see people who are the victims of injustice, we can see Christ in them, specifically, or Christ's experience in them, specifically. We can see Christ coming to us in a certain sense and offering us grace through them. And we can also be sure that that's the very situation that somehow, in the cosmic plan centered on Christ, will actually bring about the resurrection, bring about the eschaton and the restoration of all things, which is when justice will be done. If there was any injustice done, which they're clear, which would, you know, Clearly, there's tons of injustice, but no matter whether you're satisfied with this verdict or not, in the, at the end of time, God who knows everything. I mean, now, sadly, we have Zimmerman can speak for himself, but no one can speak for Trayvon Martin. Well, in the last day, God will speak for everyone. God will show us all the facts, and a right ruling will be made. Um, and then there will be mercy involved as well for those who cast themselves on it. But here's the thing. Here's the scary thing for people, all right? Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman are both an image of Christ. Trayvon Martin is an image of Christ because he is someone who was oppressed, was was discriminated against because of his race, was discriminated against because of his uh, situation, his cultural situation, how he was dressed, um, and was killed, uh, uh, was unarmed, and was killed. 
there is something about that that is indeed image Christ. Now, people can say, well, he was a thug. He was kicked out of school twice. He was a drug user. He was like a thief. And he flipped the bird at the camera all the time. Yeah, well, that's it. those are exactly the kind of people Christ said to find him in. When Christ says he'll be found in the poor, he doesn't mean the Dickensian poor, the nice poor, the, the you know, the Bob Cratchits. Have you ever met poor people? There's a lot of people like that in the poor. That Those are who he means. That's Those are the kind of people whom Christ is to be found in. There's a reason why Christ, I think, was so physically unappealing during the Passion, why he was so repulsive, was because he wanted us to be, find him in the people whom we find repulsive and who scare us, right? The people who we think are criminals. We're supposed to see Christ specifically in them. So Trayvon Martin lying there dead with Skittles falling out of his pocket, wearing a hoodie, is reminds us of the Passion, and, and we should and brings us should bring us back to the passion and we can see the passion we can see the cross's shadow falling on that and trayvon martin is an image of christ laying there slain but george, george zimmerman strangely enough is also an image of christ someone who has a violent has a history of violence has a history of uh, has had run-ins with the police before clearly has a lot of problems right he ha has his own issues but was a member of the neighborhood watch was trying to do good had done good had mentored black kids like i mentioned and had actually successfully stopped criminals before someone who's trying in spite of all his flaws to do the right thing well we can see christ in that we, if we're someone raised catholic so we can assume baptized conform to christ objectively by the by way of the sacraments a member of christ's body and someone who is in desperate need of forgiveness. And this is the thing. Should he have gotten out of his car? In my opinion, hell no. Should have stayed in the car. Should not have killed another human being. Taken another life. Attacked another he soul made in the image of God. And by virtue of the fact that he was wrong and did something horrible, that means he deserves forgiveness. That's what the Christian response to that is. The Christian response is to firmly affirm the existence of sin and say that that means that there must be forgiveness and then promptly take that route that's what he needs is forgiveness the cross was for him as much as it was for trayvon martin and for his sins and now as somebody who <laughs> was on trial and now there are crowds baying for his blood and setting out to kill him who cannot probably feel safe for the rest of his life well what does that remind you of other than crowds chanting for christ to be killed and if that offends you if if george zimmerman being uh being uh, the death of his, his death being called for being compared to christ's death being called for if that offends you well good it's supposed to be offensive right christ identifying with and, and, and if trayvon martin you know who this, this kid flipped a bird all the time and and uh and was a had was suspended from school saying that he was the name of christ offends you good you, that's supposed to be offensive you're not supposed to find christ where he's nice christ goes out to the margins and that's where you look for him and that's where you see him and <laughs> and so I, I would say this is why this is how we have to couch this dialogue that's how we have to approach the situation is to see both of them image christ both of their situations remind us of christ and where do we go from there and both of them needed forgiveness, and Zimmerman is the one who currently needs forgiveness, even though that doesn't... And that, but and there's social injustice, there's institutionalized injustice, and we need to repair that, rather than respond to violence with more violence, which is the opposite of the Christian way. And that's the other thing. How do we respond to what Zimmerman did? Is it to try to, to want him killed, and to be, get really angry and indignant at him? Well, no. Again, he's a broken man, and the law happens to protect him. If And if the law is unjust... Deal with that, right? Get angry about that, but love him. Love him actively. And and someone really needs to paint uh, George Zimmerman and Trayvon Martin instead of wrestling on the ground uh, with locked with their arms locked together, walking up towards the gates of paradise. That's that's what someone really needs to depict. Uh, or or maybe having a beer summit with Jesus. <laughs> Anyways, that's all I have to say on that matter. Somehow, may justice come out of all this. May God forgive us all. Take care.